When I smell the combination of ground meat and onions, it's like I'm transported back in time. Memories of family, childhood, and culture flood my mind. This heaven scent combo is found in the first American fast food staple known as a White Castle slider, as well as the national dish of Syria and Lebanon known as kibbe. Let me explain. My name is Josh Chitwood. Yes, Chitwood, as in the fictional sharpshooter Jimmy Chitwood from the 1986 film Hoosiers. In addition to Joey Chitwood, the stunt driver who ironically was also the first man to wear a seatbelt in the Indianapolis 500. Chitwood is my direct paternal surname passed down from generations of fathers before me. However, if I follow my maternal lineage, it brings me to the family name Frigi. This is where Kibi comes in. A central piece of my heritage, often reminds me as a child, is that we are Frigis, and that we are Lebanese or Syrian, depending on who you ask. In 2007, my middle school home economics class had an assignment. We were to cook a meal for our family, preferably the chicken parmesan recipe provided by our teacher. Or we could create a menu ourselves. I chose the latter. I remember coming home to my mom and enthusiastically telling her that I wanted to cook a full Lebanese meal all by myself. Now anyone familiar with Middle Eastern cookery can tell you that this is no quick task. For the next several days, I chopped countless vegetables, buttered sheet after sheet of filo dough, and forced meat through a grinder. In the end, I felt like the ultimate Holy Land chef, and this sparked a desire to learn more about my heritage. A pillar in the Frigi family, within my lifetime, had been my great-great Aunt Louise. She lived to be 100. My wife and I filmed an interview with her in 2016, and for several years, I've collected obscure books on the Syrian-Lebanese diaspora, attempted to learn Arabic, and I've tried to piece together our fragmented heritage. For hundreds of years, the Turkish-led Ottoman Empire occupied an area known as Greater Syria, which included both modern-day Lebanon and Syria. Between 1880 and 1914, nearly 100,000 Arabic-speaking immigrants left their homeland to come to the United States. The driving factor for this great wave of immigration was in fact economic pursuit. Though tension between religious factions in Syria played a role in specifically Christian minorities making this journey, at least 90% of early Syrians immigrated from the Mount Lebanon district of Greater Syria and were predominantly Christian. In turn, Muslim and Druze Syrians would be the religious minority crossing onto American soil. Often mislabeled as Arabians, Armenians, or Turks, in 1899, the United States Immigration Bureau added the classification of Syrian for any immigrants coming from greater Syria. Overcoming differences and prejudices, Syrians quickly found themselves interwoven into the fabric of America as peddlers. Syrian peddlers traveled from town to town, selling everything from religious icons and trinkets to jewelry and fabric. Peddling took newly arrived Syrians into the homes of Americans, enabling them to learn the language and customs of their new adopted country. This was the story for my great-great-great-grandparents, Abraham and Latifa Frigi. My father came from Syria when he was 15 years old. He, he left his mother and came here, but but he never went back. He never went back. But he didn't want to go. He didn't want to go back. Grandpa Abraham immigrated to the United States in 1902. And by 1905, he settled in Indianapolis as a peddler on Willard Street, a small street made up of mainly Syrian immigrants and African Americans. Grandma Latifa, on the other hand, made her journey to the United States in 1907 from Biskinta, Syria, centered in modern-day Lebanon and first settled in Connecticut. Four years later, as drivers first embarked a 500-mile race back in Indianapolis, Latifa embarked on a journey of her own, marriage. My dad and mother got married in Connecticut, 1911. Abraham and Latifa returned to Indianapolis, where the Syrian population had grown to over 1,000. They established themselves on Willard Street, operating a dry goods store, and the two began to grow their family. We all were born here in Indianapolis. Corrine, Mary, Mabel, Louise, and my precious brother, John. After heated court hearings in 1915, Syrians became classified as white in the eyes of U.S. law, making way for citizenship 
ownership, and assimilation. Many Indianapolis Syrian peddlers became dry goods store operators by 1915. That year, there were at least 18 Arabic-speaking grocers spread throughout Indianapolis. Willard Street, which was once the hardened home of early Arab Indianapolis, is today buried beneath the home turf of the Indianapolis Colts, the house that Peyton built, Lucas Oil Stadium. As the boy who wore Colts gear almost every day in the early 2000s, I find great pride knowing that this is where the Fiji legacy began in Indianapolis. By 1917, Abraham and Latifa moved their business from Willard Street to Blake Street, the same year that Aunt Louise was born. I'm Louise Burgett, and I'm talking to you all about my family. We first lived on Blake Street. Then Dad built a big building, and we moved on Dexter. We had a grocery store there, our living quarters, two apartments upstairs, the barber shop and the beauty shop. Every Sunday morning, he'd get up and make gravy and biscuits for us every Sunday morning, that's what we had. They were living the American dream. But in 1922, grief overcame the Fiji household. My mother died when she was 35 and left five little kids. Corinne was the oldest. My brother was 18 months old. In 1922, Latifa gave birth to their sixth child, Sadie, who only lived to be 10 days old. While still mourning the loss of Sadie, Latifa died of heart failure. Following this tragic heartache, Abraham displayed a determined work ethic by managing his grocery store and overseeing his building on Dexter. Though around the corner in the 1930s was a global economic crisis, the Great Depression. Amidst financial instability, Abraham returned to peddling in order to keep his business afloat. Unable to recover his prosperous investments, in 1935, he lost his impressive building on Dexter Street. My dad was well-to-do, and when he lost that building, it was awful. I don't know how he ever made it. It was a big building, big building. Every Sunday, we get out with that old Ford and polish it and get all ready and he'd take us to church. And most of the time, he'd take us to the cemetery where my mother was buried. And I had a little sister buried there too. Every Sunday, that's what we did. He was a wonderful father. For years, he was a father and mother to us until he married my stepmother. Then they had five children. Abraham continued peddling until he reopened a small grocery store on Miley Avenue in 1936. And by 1940, he made permanent routes on Traub Avenue where he opened his final grocery store. By this time, over 200,000 Syrians called America their permanent home, a modest number compared to the millions allowed from European countries. Three years later, in 1943, Lebanon gained independence, and many American-born Syrians would adopt the term Lebanese when referring to their heritage. For our family, the Syrian way was slowly becoming a distant memory, captured in stories, family, and food. Sometimes he talked to us in Arabic, and we knew what he was saying, but we couldn't answer him in Arabic. We couldn't answer him. He'd be talking to my husband, and he started talking, and he'd go in Arabic, and I'd say, Dad, Charlie don't know what you're saying. All five of Abraham and Latifa's children went on to marry non-Syrian Hoosiers, and our family began to grow and spread throughout Indianapolis. The Fiji family bond, to me, it was primarily those five children of Grandpa, the first five. They were as close as any family you can imagine. They were very protective of their children. They were very protective of each other. We had a village. We never called ourselves Fijis. We were cousins. I grew up across the street from my grandfather. A lot of times, the ants would all get together 
they'd go over at Grandpa's and they'd fix Kibbe. And when we were little kids, I mean, that was a treat to us, raw Kibbe. We used to eat it all the time. We had salatha, which is basically just a salad, but we used to grow nana, and that was peppermint in Arabic. And so we'd put our fresh stuff in there. And uh, the Syrian bread, and, uh, and once in a while we would have chicken and, you know, the American stuff, but overall we loved Syrian food. Well, you know, he used to tell us a lot of stories. He'd be on it in a chair and we'd get her on the floor. It was always way down by Mount Lebanon. Way down by Mount Lebanon. Something to that. Maybe my accent's not good. His father and him were taken camels from Damascus to uh, Beirut. They had to spend overnight on that trip. They started hearing wolves. So they lined the camels around him, and he said them camels is what saved their lives that night. And then he, he told us about uh, going to Bethlehem and seeing the place where Jesus was born. To me, that was very exciting. Grandpa told me about the Ku Klux Klan coming and burning crosses in front of his home and store. And these were basically saying, get out of town. Well, they didn't. Of course, you know, to have that done, it scares you to death. When I was smaller, people scared me. But they were older people, and they were calling me dirty names and, you know, towel heads. If we were saying with the N-word, when we were small kids, hey, them were, them were fighting words. You know, you overcome that. You overcome that. It's just people that are ignorant. I'm proud to be American. I'm proud that he come over here with no English, no one to help him, and faced everything he had to do to make it in business. When I was with him, these people loved him. He went out into the, what he called the country, I don't know exactly where, in the outskirts of Indianapolis or further. And uh, he had dry goods in the car, and he was a salesman. As soon as you pull up, the kids had come running out, and we either usually had suckers or bubble gum, and that was his gift, as the banks do today. He had a rolling business. He, he knew how to handle people. It was a neighborhood grocery store. He almost knew everybody in the neighborhood. People didn't drive 10 miles to get there. Most people walked. He would write in Arabic what people got, and he'd have a little clipboard, at the end of the week, they would come and pay him. And they'd just say, hey, Mr. Fregi, everybody called him Mr. Fregi, I got two bananas. And they'd walk out the door, and he'd put it on there. I recall people coming in, they weren't there just to shop. They'd come in to socialize too, talk about world issues, what's going on in the world. Before the first Lebanese war, when Grandpa was still alive, I wanted to take him to Syria or Lebanon, whatever it happened to be at the time, where he was from, and we never made it. And I never made it. So maybe one of these years I will, but I, I think I got a lot from Grandpa. He wanted everybody to be nice, happy, honest, loving, a lot of virtues. We didn't sit down and write them down on paper. You just learned them. In 1964, as the civil rights movement was in full effect, Grandpa Abraham breathed his last breath in the land of opportunity, leaving behind an extensive family of hardworking Hoosiers. Hard work will get you where you're going. That's where I'm at today is because I did hard work. They're a wonderful family, and, I, and I'm very happy to be in with them too. I'm very happy. I love them all. I love them all, my nieces and nephews. I miss my parents. I don't remember my mother, but I do miss my dad. I don't know how I got this old. I don't know why I'm here, but there's a reason. The story of Abraham and Latifah Frigi is not one of great fame or influence. 
I wanted persistence, hard work, and family honor. I'm proud to be American, and I'm proud to have Arab and Hoosier roots. In my mind, these two are not separate. Like ground meat and onions, our ingredients of ethnicity and heritage take new forms through time, location, and marriage. Our stories are not singular. For me, I want my children to know that we have deep roots planted along a narrow path that began in the East. We may not always know where the path will lead, but we must never forget to look back and to continue moving forward.